Welcome back to my channel. Today's interview is with an ex Arbon rep who earned six figures and was at the top and walked away from all of it. In this interview, you will hear me refer to her as Jane Doe, and you will find out why. If you're not familiar with Arbon, allow me to give you a brief rundown. Arbon has been around since the 1980s and claims to be a certified organic company with skincare, protein shakes, health supplements, makeup, and more. I remember meeting my first Arbon lady back in junior high. At the time of this recording, I'm 33 years old, so that would have been quite some time ago, and I never heard much about Arbon again. Within the multi level marketing industry, it seemed that Arbon faded into the background. In fact, as you'll see by this video from their conference in 2010, Arbonne didn't seem as hip as some other companies. But something else happened in 2010. According to the website MLM-TheWholeTruth.com, Arbonne's parent company, Natural Products Group LLC, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in order to reduce company debts because Arbonne was allegedly upside down by more than $500 million. In 2009, Arbon had $286 million in assets and $518 million in liabilities. So after filing for bankruptcy, did Arbon refund sellers and shut down? Not a chance. Instead, Arbon rebranded. Suddenly, their website and conferences were appealing more to millennials, and their so-called white parties are all the rage, and you just have to work your business and grow your team so you can be there next year too. Arbonne is also known for giving their distributors a brand new Mercedes, but it must be white, it must be leased in your name, it must have the Arbonne logo in three different places on the car, and if you don't meet your quota, well, then the payment falls on you. Arbonne loves to throw fancy parties and hire self-proclaimed self-help gurus like Rachel Hollis, shown here at Arbonne's 2019 conference. In what I'm about to show you, I want you to pay attention how Rachel Hollis puts words in an Arbonne distributor's mouth and then tells her that if her sister doesn't want to support her in her business, then she should stop interacting with her sister. <laughs> Okay, your sister's trying to do for what? For doing this business. You're going to have someone in their life who's supposed to be this And why do you care? You love her. Does she love you? Then why does she want the best for you? Um, do you feel like she is judging you because she's scared that you're changing? Because she doesn't understand what you're actually doing? So can you tell me? Having been in the top 1% in three different network marketing companies myself over a span of nearly six years, I can attest to the fact that not all that glitters is gold. Once the shine wears off, sometimes it really just looks like a lot of stressful company policies, drama, broken promises, and some brainwashing mixed in. In today's episode, I interview Jane Doe. She joined Arbon after losing 70 pounds and quickly became a six-figure earner. She earned the rank of area manager, built a team, attended fancy parties and received awards, and was even featured in Arbon's catalog. Jane Doe was super close to Arbon's prestigious rank of vice president before walking away from all of it. She had an upline who was never around to help her unless there was a camera to document it. And although when she joined the company, she was told by her upline that she was giving her a special discount for signing with her, Jane Doe learned later it was actually just the discount given by the company to all its distributors. But that's the least of what made her walk away. And you're about to find out what did. Although Arbonne threatened her with a lawsuit, Jane Doe has decided not to be the good girl and speak out. This is her story, as told to me. So 
So, hello, my Jane Doe. <laughs> hello. And for everybody who is watching, Jane Doe is what we are calling this lovely ex Arbon rep uh, who is kind enough to speak with us and share her insider world of what happened to her on her MLM journey. Um, and she is still under contract. So, why don't you tell us before you dive in, Jane Doe, about how you got started with Arbon? Tell us why I have to refer to you as Jane Doe. So for those of you watching, gosh, you guys, this just feels so surreal. I remember exactly when I decided to leave Arbonne and I was so scared because I thought I was the only person who dealt with things like this. And after seeing so many people come out, I just knew it was my time to share my story. But little funny thing is I really can't say who I am right now. I can't say much about myself because... Yeah, I mean, I don't want to bring out any legal action, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm not going to toot my own horn, but I was a pretty big deal in Arbonne. I was actually a brand ambassador in Arbonne. They sent me products before anybody else knew who, before they even launched. And so when I left, when I decided to leave Arbonne, I guess they saw that I was a big threat and they didn't want me to, I guess, tell my story to the world. And so I have a year to say exactly who I am. But I can't say my name just yet because, like she said, I'm under contract. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, and it's it's so crazy because you didn't come out the gate when you left Arbonne speaking out about the company or anything like that. But even with what I've seen, and like you said, you're like, I don't know if I'm a big deal or whatever, but no, you are a big deal. And it's, it's good to see from the people who have been higher up behind the scenes, because this is what people need to see. Because a lot of pro MLMers like to say, oh, all those anti MLMers, they failed and now they're bitter. And that's why they're doing anti MLM. And that's not the truth. People like us who have seen behind the scenes were like, oh my gosh, no, it's like peeking behind the curtain and it's at all. Crazy. Us. Yeah, it's crazy because we I used to say that. Whenever somebody would leave, I'd be like, Oh, their vision isn't big enough. Oh, they just didn't try hard enough. Oh, if they just went ahead and did personal growth. You guys, I was the person who never missed a Zoom call. I was the person who never missed a big event in Vegas. I was the person who was leading from the front. I was running trainings. I was one of the people who walked the stage. I was walking the walk, talking the talk, being the product of the product. I was everything. And so, yeah, it's not that we didn't try hard enough. It's a simple fact that I guess we, were, we weren't as hypnotized as everyone else was. And uh, yeah, and it, for, for people like us, I feel like we get to a point where we're like, the money's just not worth it when you're, when you feel like you're recruiting the fail and you feel all the pressure from these companies. And it's crazy to me that they put this contract on you when you quit as a 1099 worker, which is interesting. I don't even know if that's a really a uh, legal thing they can do, but I'm not an attorney, but I witnessed being up where I was, even though I wasn't like at the very, very top a lot my uplines were and I saw people getting sued and then just like knowing people in the industry who have been way way up at the very top of the pyramid the pyramid I've seen them switch to another company and then their former MLM sues them and it's shocking like it's so dirty it's so corrupt and this is what they hide from everybody I mean it's just disgusting so you are under contract that's why you are our Jane Doe today but I can't wait till you can speak out <laughs> and tell yeah. us how you got started like what drew you in because I remember you were saying like that when we talked before that you were like didn't want anything to do with it so tell us how you got started I love that question and so um, I actually got started when I was 18. And so I remember just feeling like I had no idea what I, what I wanted to do with my life. And seeing that my dad co-owns a restaurant, he had, you know, the freedom to do what he wanted. He loved his job. And so at that point in my life, I knew that I wanted to be self-employed. That's what I knew I wanted to do that. But at 18, it's really hard to be self-employed unless you have, you know, a lot of income coming in. And so for me, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And at that point in my life, the only thing that I knew is that I wanted to work on myself. I knew that if I could love myself first, that it would have been easy to pick a career and love on other people that way. And so I remember I was 18 and at that point I was super stressed out. All of my friends were going to college and I felt like my life was just at a standstill. 
I started gaining a lot of weight. And so I'm five to you guys. And so I like to joke around and say, I'm a midget because I really am. And I was 215. And so at that point I knew that I wanted to start a weight loss journey, but I wanted to stick to my weight loss journey. And I wanted to fall in love with my weight loss journey. And that's when I saw a video. A lot of people know who she is. If you look on Twitter, you search up Arbon, you're probably going to find her video, but she went through a really big weight loss. And I remember at that point, when I saw that video, I said, if she can do it, I can do it. And that's a lot of things that MLMs do. If she can do it, I can do it. And so I remember just thinking that if she can do it, I can do it. So I reached out to her and I started my first 30 days of healthy living. And within six months, I lost 70 pounds. I started lifting. I started, you know, I, now I lift really heavy. I work out five days a week. I love the gym and that's my outlet. This time in my fitness journey, I'm doing it for myself. And so at that point, every time that she would just see that I would lose more and more and more weight, my sponsor upline, whatever you want to call it, she would be like, you really need to look into this business. Like you love the products. Why don't you just sign up? And I would always say, I'm sorry. I just don't want to be one of those Mary Kay ladies. I, I, I don't want to do this. Sorry. I'm not one of those people that bugs people. And she was just really persistent. I'll give her that. And the last month I was like, what the heck? Let me go ahead and just listen to what she has to say. She promised me half off. A whole entire kit, which now that I know it's your consultant price, which is not even she's so she was oh, yeah. giving you a discount. She was making she was manipulating the discount they already get to make it seem like she was giving you something special. Yeah, exactly. So when I heard that, you know, when you're 18, you're like, oh my god, I don't have a lot of money. Yes, heck yes. So we decided to meet up at a Starbucks. And for me, knowing that I wanted to be self-employed, I thought this was my way to be self-employed. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I had a purpose and I felt like I was on fire for the first time. So I started my business and within seven days, I reached the first level of management. Um, within the next week and a half, I went ahead and qualified for the second level. And from there, it was just, it was just like a rocket ship. And for me, I loved it for the first year, but with that, with being a leader, quote unquote, it came with so much responsibility and being that you're 18 I feel like I was talking to my boyfriend about this other day and I, and I say that basically they took away my early twenties. I wasn't able to experience what most 20, 21, 22 year olds experience. I wasn't able to go out and have fun. I wasn't able to be a normal, you know, not teenager, but a normal like adult, I guess you can say, because I was so focused on an end goal that was never going to be reached. And let me guess, there was probably a mission that she used also to lure you in. Like some, was it some kind of like, we're helping people, we're making the world a better place. I feel like MLMs always have a mission that they hide behind as to help like manipulate people. Yes. So she would always, so one thing that her and I had common ground was, is that we both came from a really big weight loss. And later coming into my Arbon journey, I found out that she didn't lose all her weight through Arbon. She lost weight through doing other things. So I thought initially when I was coming into Arbonne that her and I had the common ground of helping women feel empowered and beautiful, helping women feel like, you know, once that weight is off that they, they feel like they're unstoppable. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to say yes, because once I lost all of that weight, there was just something that switched in me. I just felt so much confident. I felt happier. And I knew that if I felt this way, that I wanted to help other women feel that way. But looking back now, there's so many other ways that you can help women feel empowered. And there's so many other ways that you can help, you know, 18, 19 college students, you know, 35, 45 year olds feel empowered without an MLM. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing is like, it really does start out so innocently. You think that you're getting in because you just love feeling a certain way, you love the product, and you want to help other people experience these great feelings you're feeling. And you said, you know, it's great for you for about a, the first year. That's how it was for me. For the first two, two and a half years, it was great for me. And then I started to like see things. So when did it start turning? When did the tide start turning? When did you get in a little deeper where you're like, hold up, like, cause you grew fast. I remember you telling me that by like your third month, you were already making six figures. Is that correct? Yeah. So that I took remember. me three years to do like, that's absolutely crazy that you were able to do that in three months. I, I can't imagine how overwhelmed you felt. Not that the money wasn't great, but I, I'm sure you felt very overwhelmed. Gosh. Yes. I remember just having different people ask me, how did you do it? How did you do it? Like putting me on a pedestal. And I think for me at that point, when people started putting me on a pedestal, 
And when the higher ups that were on the pedestal, they felt like they were just so grand about themselves. That's when it hit me. And I guess I can back up and say it hit me within six months. Let me just tell you six months. Um, but for me being that I was considered a leader and I was considered a pace runner and I was considered somebody who paved the way for other people, I felt like I had to be a certain person around everybody. And I felt like once I got in the room that, and I had to like, just get super giggly and get super excited. And I remember just, it hit me, especially when one day my sponsor and I, we were having breakfast. Um, and it was weird because her and I wouldn't talk for like a whole month. And then she would randomly ask me to breakfast to see how I was doing. She didn't really help me build my business, but anyway, and let me we say, let me, before you get into this, sorry to interrupt you, before you get in about the lunch, I just want people to understand because I, I got a bunch of comments on my first video about why I left the industry. And there were so many people who were like, I don't know why people fall for these things or like, I don't understand how they stay in it. Well, there's a lot of thought programming and undue influence that they use, um, like cults do. In fact, like professionals, licensed therapists call these commercial cults. And what you said about like, like your upline being like super famous and you being looked at and like put on a pedestal, that is not abnormal. The top, the very, very top people are looked at like that. I remember going to my first um, annual conference that the my first company put on and my upline, who was like the number one person that year, she had a line of people that was probably a mile long and she stood there for hours just so each person could take a photo shoot with her. Now, before she was in that MLM and successful, she was a bartender. So you really do gain this like celebrity status within and everyone wants that because they're told like, oh, once you get here, everything's going to be better. So people keep just working themselves to death, thinking that they too can get there, how that person did when 99% fail, according to the FTC. And so I just want people to realize like, it really, like th these people are celebrated. They are made to look like gods and idols within these companies. Gosh, yep. And that's exactly where I was. Everyone was always shower me with gifts. They wanted to take pictures of me. They knew me as the girl who lost weight. They knew me as the girl who went ahead and reached area manager within like 15 days. Like they knew me as that. And in the inside, I was like, but you don't understand. But anyway, so I, you went to lunch. Yeah. I, I, I went to lunch with her and I'm going to tell you two different stories on when I kind of like was like, okay, this is like, this kind of seems like unattainable or like weird. So the first thing I went to lunch with her and I guess we were just strategizing. And I remember asking her a question like, man, like, um, how are you doing it? Like what, like how, how are you building to the next level? And one thing that kind of like really shook me, she was like, honey, if in a week somebody isn't making you money, do you want to go ahead and just check them off your list and go to the next person? And that to me broke my heart because when somebody is wanting to be an entrepreneur or work for themselves or do anything, start a business, they need a mentor and they need guidance. And that for me was like, wow. So I thought to myself, if I didn't make you money within the first week, would you have just left me? And it was just really weird because I, I gained, I guess you could say fame, but it was just weird because I saw who, who she was behind the scenes. The second instance where everything kind of like was wow to me was I remember sitting one time with some top leaders as well. And I asked them, you know, what does it look like now for you? And they told me, well, it's not easy. We're struggling. It's super hard to just even keep our maintenance. It's super hard to even like get this number every single month. So the higher you get up, it's actually going to get harder. So that to me was when I was just like, this is what I have to look forward to. I'm like, wow, wow, wow. Mm. That is so tough. Uh, yeah. And I, I saw that with my first upline where it's, you could not even get, uh, you know, her to even acknowledge you in a comment, not even like a like or something on one of her posts, unless you were hitting your quota and hitting it religiously. Like otherwise she would not acknowledge you. And that thought process that your upline had, that's pushed by these MLMs because in MLMs, you have to have such a flood of people coming in at all times because the attrition rate is so high. Like when so many people come in, so many more people leave. So you're constantly trying to build this house on sand. 
you have no firm foundation. And so you have to keep building people in. So that mindset that's like, oh, well, if they're not making money, then you need to get onto the next person. That is absolutely how it is. And it's, it's horrible. And if it's not like that, like I had an upline who would help everyone and she would work with everyone. She was so overwhelmed because she had to keep bringing so many people in to make money. She was so overwhelmed. Like she got incredibly sick. Oh my I mean, gosh, I relate. That was me. I, I'm that leader. I was that leader. So I remember when I would just see her behavior, it was almost like I had FOMO. It was almost like I needed to do so well for her to even notice me. And it was, it was sad because I was actually number two in the entire company who brought in the most business partners and, and consultants and clients. Number two, Harbon gave me a $4,000 ring as a thank you. And I walked the stage in front of thousands of people. And even then, not a single congratulations, not a single thank you. And I remember just feeling that way and saying, if my upline is going to be that way, I'm going to be the opposite. And I'm going to love on my team. And I was so overwhelmed. I remember um, I just got so stressed and I got a fever of 107 like in December. And I was so stressed. I had an anxiety attack and it was just like the weight on my shoulders. If I told somebody, no, I was just going to disappoint somebody. Whereas if she told somebody, no, oh, you're off the hook, girl, you're so busy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. See, and that's, I mean, that's the thing I hear people say a lot of times, like, especially in the comments, oh, that's horrible. You went through that, but my MLM is different. And I'm like, no, honey, I've been in three. I've been in the top of three. They're all the same. They all use the same tactics. It doesn't matter. It might be a different compensation plan, whether it's unilevel or binary, it might be different products, but the tactics are the same. And when you said like the anxiety attack, I remember I've had three panic attacks in my life. First one was when I was going through a divorce very stressful divorce over a decade ago. The second one was when there was a death of a friend. And the third one was in an MLM. And that's when I was like, I have to, it was my last MLM. And I was like, this is not worth it. This is so stressful. This is not worth it. So what were some of the things, like, when did it start to change for you where you were just like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Like I need to leave. Like what started happening there? So for me, um, after winning a lot of trips, I guess every time I would go on a trip that I won to me, it would ignite my fire. And I would tell myself, maybe I'm the crazy one who's losing my momentum, or maybe it's me. Maybe I have to be a better leader, but it wasn't until my boyfriend, um, Hold on. Was I want to pause you right there. Sorry to interrupt again, but what yeah. you just said about the trips and that it would reignite your fire. Leah Remini said the same thing in Scientology and the aftermath when she was saying, I started having doubts about the church and about Scientology. And then I would go to the church to these big events and they would show us all these videos of how they were changing the world and all the good they were doing. And she thought, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's just me. Like, look at how much good we're doing. Like, how could I not want to be a part of this? And those mm -hmm. trips that you're talking about, I've been on those trips and I don't know about you, but in all the companies I was a part of, you don't get breaks on those trips. They don't leave any room for you to just go hang out and relax. Like you or you'll, you'll be missing something if you do that. Like they have conference after conference, after event, after event, after workshop, after workshop to keep indoctrinating you so that you think like, yes, I need to stay like, yes, this is how it's supposed to be. Is that how it was on those trips for you? Yes. So there was two different trips that would always ignite my fire. So the first trip was the company trip that you're talking about. You would go to Vegas, you would dress up super cute, take super cute pictures, share the world like this is what I'm doing, create that FOMO for the world, get training after training after training. I remember there was like specific training I had to go to since I was a leader, dinners because you won awards, things like that. So you feel like, oh, I'm important. The other trips were the trips that you won. So the, the free trips that they're talking about. Those trips where you get cocktail after cocktail, where you can just get massages for free, where you can get hair done for free. Like those were the trips where I was like, this is what I love. I love relaxing. Maybe I'm being crazy because if I leave, I won't get this. But when everything hit me was when my boyfriend was actually hospitalized. He um, was hospitalized for about a week. He lost seven pounds in like, I think three or four days. He was very, very pale. And I remember thinking I built an organization so big that I could take time off. Right. And I remember just feeling because I wasn't in a team call or feeling because I didn't show up or feeling because I didn't have a coffee date or feeling because I didn't have a call that day that I was 
letting my uplines down. And it was never directly said, but there was, there was just a feeling and attention that you can feel that because you are not showing up to your business, you're failing them. And it hurt me so much because that was an emergency where I had to just leave. And I, I couldn't be on every team call that week. And I couldn't, you know, prospect the way that I wanted to prospect. I couldn't go on a coffee date, sit down at Starbucks and share the opportunity. I couldn't do that because my main priority was my boyfriend at that time. And that's when it literally sucked. And that's when I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. But I went ahead and was still involved with it in, in it for a year because I was terrified of what my outside life would look like if I decided to stop and if my income was no longer going to be there. Absolutely. You get used to that income and, and you're also indoctrinated into this world where it's like, don't stop. You're almost to that level. You're almost to financial freedom. You're almost to where you can relax. There's never a point you can relax. Sure. You can take time off and the money will keep flowing in. But like you said, even if it wasn't said directly to you that no, you should not take time off, even though your boyfriend's in the hospital, it's implied and it's implied because what's rewarded is the behavior that will be repeated. And when somebody takes time off, even out of sickness, that is never rewarded ever. It's always the go, 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 burn yourself out, hustle till you die mentality that is rewarded. Yep. Exactly. That, yeah, you look, tend it. That's true. And so what happened after like that, you said you stayed for a year. So I'm assuming your boyfriend got better. What else did you see behind the scenes that you were like, I don't want to be a part of this, or I don't think this is for me or. So for me, it was a lot of the things that lower consultants didn't see. It was a lot of things like how to train your team. It was a lot of things like what to tell your team when they're feeling this way. It was a lot of training and at that point, I felt like, oh my gosh, are we like getting manipulated ourselves to manipulate our team? And at that point, I was like, I know I can't do this. And a lot of people from the down in the pyramid, I guess you can say, they would look at us and say, oh my gosh, y'all have so much fun. Y'all are always going to dinner. Y'all are always taking cute pictures. I want to be where you're at. And it was just so funny because I could never say, oh my gosh, if only you knew. And I was just, I was told to only say, yeah, girl, you can do it. And it just sucks because it's sisterhood. People want to be a part of a sisterhood and people want to be a part of like something that's bigger than themselves. So for me, my, my boiling point was when they were just telling us how to train our team. My boiling point was seeing my income and seeing my team's income. It, it didn't make sense. It was just a big old gap and seeing that I was the only one winning always. I was the only one who was always winning the dinner. It's the only one who was always winning the free trips. I was the only one who was always getting recognized. It was me, me, me. To the point where my team put me on a pedestal and they knew that what I was doing was never attainable. And that's what sucks that they put you on a pedestal and most people are never going to get there. You have to get in very, very early for you to achieve success. So that's when my one point was when I just, I couldn't take any more seeing my team like doubt themselves and me having training from upline leaders on how to manipulate my own team. Mm hmm. And yeah, and it's you have to get in early or you have to have a large network like, yes. you know, and even after having a large network, there's going to come a time when you have to start running ads, social media ads to find more people. That's something they don't tell you. Uh, there's so many things and it's so much information that it never ends like you're caught. There's just so much to do so much information. Um, tell me like with when you were seeing like your people were not hitting the success that you were. Cause I started recognizing that too. And I was just like this, like this many people can't be failing. Like I had a few girls who were having success, but everybody was stressed. Like, um, and, and compared to how many people I had recruited, I was like this many people can't be failing. And that's when my cognitive dissonance started. Cause I'm like, something's not right here. Um, for me, I know that I was always told by the MLM, by uplines that like those people who aren't succeeding, they're not working hard enough. Like they're not, you know, they're not doing enough personal development. They're not saying they're doing what, or they're not doing what they're saying they're doing. And I believed it. I totally believed it until it just got so many years upon so many years. I was like, this can't be right. So what was it like for you? What were they saying about all those people who weren't succeeding? 
same, a lot of, a lot of similarities as yours. Um, I remember my upline, I would always be like, how can I help them? What can I do to help them succeed? And she would always be like, well, it's up to them. It's not up to you. You can give them the resources. You can love on them. But if they're not working, go to the next. But here's a thing that people don't see outside of MLMs. It is so stressful to work every single day and, you know, take away three hours of your day to just be on a team call and not necessarily work. It's very, very stressful and people don't see that. And so for me, I was working my hiney off from like 12 PM to 12 AM. I had a team in Canada. And so they're three hours behind me. I'm CTC central time. And there were so many times where I would not go to sleep until like 2 AM because I was helping my Canada team. And people don't see that you're putting in so much time to love on your team and help your team. And they're not succeeding. And it always hurt my heart because I was always seeing the success, but nobody else was. And when you're 20 and you're seeing success, I mean, that's great. I, most people would feel great, but for me, I just felt an icky feeling. I felt like I was stealing from people and I felt like I didn't deserve the success because they weren't winning. And so I just don't like the way that it's built up that, you know, yeah, you have to have a big following or you have to come in first, which really, really sucks. Mm -hmm. And so when you left, like, what did that look like? What happened (laughs) when you left the cult? (laughs) So much tea. So I remember it was my breaking point. (laughs) My boyfriend and I, we moved into a luxury apartment. And I remember one day just kind of sitting down because I would work a lot from home. And when you work from home, it kind of gets a little bit boring after a while. And one day I just kind of felt like, okay, I don't feel as happy anymore. There's something here. Like, um, I think it was the beginning of a new month and we closed out one of our biggest months a month before. And I just didn't feel on fire anymore. And I felt really weird about myself. And that's when I was like, what really is Arbonne? I've been in Arbonne for almost three years. I've been in Arbonne for two and a half years. What is Arbonne? You know, what am I, what's my mission? What am I running towards? And I started researching a ton. And that's when everything kind of started unfolding. And for me, I knew that I had just had to tell my team. And I knew that I no longer wanted to be a part of it. But when you have a team like that, they're texting you all the time, seeing if you're free to, for a phone call. They're texting you for advice or te- asking you questions or all of this. And you can't just fall off the face of the earth because they're gonna, face of the earth because they're going to know that something's going on. So I just wanted to be really real and transparent and just let them know at once. And so I didn't necessarily get my whole team involved. I got about, I got my, my um, direct leaders, I guess you can say. Let me pause so you for one you second. Know. So you said that you started researching about Arbonne and that's when you were kind of like woke up. What were the things you were like researching that stood out to you? Um, and so everything I have in documentation, um, but one of the ML, anti-MLMers that really brought a lot of, she opened my eyes, what her name is Kiki Chanel. Mm-hmm. And so I love her because she actually posts like her linked um, resources. And so I actually saved some of her resources, but specifically they got a new CEO and I didn't know why. So you're always heard of people are starting new projects or they wanted to do something different. I didn't know why they got a new CEO in 2009, they got sued and for, for putting out false claims, a lot of top leaders left. And I always heard of people leaving going to different network marketing companies. I would always hear my sponsors saying you need to block them so they don't you know, see what you're doing. You need to go ahead and tell your team to block them. And everything started to make sense. People were leaving Arbonne because of the system, because of the way it was built. People were leaving Arbonne because it was so hard to keep up with your maintenance. People were leaving Arbonne because the income just wasn't worth it for your mental health. And that's where I was feeling my mental health was at its all time low. Mm. I feel like I had to be a certain person online. And there's so many posts, if like people look at my Instagram, they're going to see that I looked so happy. But as I was writing those posts, I was crying writing those posts. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, this is like one day I'm happy. One day I'm sad. One day I'm stressed. One day I'm mad. It was just so horrible for myself being only 20 years old, having to deal with those many problems. So when I left word got around really, really fast. I had a zoom with my team And within 10 minutes, I kid you not, my upline um, texted me. And prior to that text, I had not talked to her since our Vegas global training conference. And which was months prior to that, months prior to that. And she texted me and she said, is it true that you're leaving? 
at that point, I knew I, I realized you don't care about me. You don't care about anything that I'm doing. You just care about the income that I'm giving you. And what you, you about- just said is it's so this is none of this is only uh, with Arbonne. Like this is with all the companies what I want people to understand. And what you said, like you, you hadn't seen her in months and she reached out and was like, are you leaving? Are you quitting? That's how it is with so many of them. And it's like, like I said, I believe that all these people, even the uplines are victims in of these commercial cults it's the ceos um the coaches for network marketers those are the people who i believe are like the cult leaders um those are the ones who we should not be looking to at at all as victims they're just bad but the victims in this even the uplines they're just they've been more indoctrinated and what you said it's like it's so true like you can have uplines not speak to you and when you're in the top everybody thinks like everyone's best friends and that they always hang out and yada yada but i remember i would go to these retreats and we would do like photo shoots and then i wouldn't hear from my upline even though i was hitting all my quotas non-stop and exceeding them i wouldn't hear from her for a long time and but she'd be posting pictures of us from our retreats and being like my business besties yada 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 and so people think like i want to be in that like i want that girl club like i want to be a part of that it's like you never see her or talk to her and that's how it is in so many of these these companies and it's yeah it's an illusion it's, it's- it's more like it was for someone who was you and I, who would always hit our numbers, who would always hit our bonuses. It was more towards, it was expected of us from our uplines. Like they knew, oh, yeah. they're going to hit their bonuses ne- next person. But mm-hmm. the thing is, is like, it's horrible. So yeah, I remember when um, she texted me, that's when I was like, girlfriend, I'm a big reason why your income is so big. So I just decided, you know what? I'm not going to be ugly. I'm just going to go ahead and block her and block that negativity. So I just blocked her. She was super toxic anyway. Um, And then word got around so, like, so fast. Her upline texted me. Then her upline texted me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wanted to leave in, like, the nicest way possible. But you guys are not making me leave in the nicest way possible. They then, gosh, they then blocked me from all of their group messages. And there was specific training on, you know, block block this person. And she's leaving Arbonne. You need to block her so she doesn't go ahead and text you and text your team. And they made me seem like I was such a villain. And at that point, I couldn't defend myself because everyone was siding with them. It, it's as like, it's as if, you know, I, I couldn't say, I couldn't save myself. I couldn't defend myself. I couldn't, you know, say why I was actually leaving. Everybody was just like, let's block this person. Let's get her yeah. out of our lives next. You cannot try and be rational with an irrational mindset. And anybody inside the cult, they're not thinking properly. They have an irrational mindset. And anybody who leaves is shunned. You are excommunicated. You are no longer with us. Therefore, you are against us. It doesn't matter your reasonings. You are shunned. You are done. And that's how it is. And it's so sad. And it's so weird because people who were even making any money, whenever they left, it was like, okay, bye. Like, I wish you the best. But for the people who were known, the people who were making a lot of money and the people that the company knew, that's when they were like, that's when they're like, you're shunned, you're blocked, like leave. We don't know why you're leaving. We don't know why you would leave this income. So it was as if like, you know, you can never win. So I just, at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to let it be. And if people still want to talk to me, some will, some won't. I'll share my story one day. And it's so crazy that now I'm kind of sharing a little bit about my story and it's just I feel like there is just so much weight that's getting lifted off my shoulders because I'm finally able to share with the world. Like, this is what it looks like when you're on the top of the pyramid. And this is what it looks like when you're in these MLMs and it's not what you think it is. And just because people are posting happy posts and they're posting about their winning their bonuses doesn't mean they're happy all the time. They're struggling. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking to like do anything like this, do your research. And we're not doing these videos to, you know, harm anybody or to, you know, be, vicious girls mean girls were doing this to educate people and I just wish I saw a video like this when I was 18 and I right. wish somebody told me this before I you know was a part of something like this and what you said about one day is really good and then one day it's just you're in tears it's horrible it's such a hard day that's how it was but they had verbiage um that they would use to combat anytime you would have like, oh my God, this is so hard. I know I can do this. They're like, this is the entrepreneur lifestyle. It's a roller coaster. Like this is how it is. But hey, you're going to get there. Like you're going to be see this success. Think of all the people you're helping. And yes, entrepreneurship is not easy. Yes, it can be very hard and it can be like a roller coaster. 
but not in the sense where you have all this indoctrination and undue influence and thought programming used on you and toxic positivity, which is what an MLM consists of. And so anytime you complain or you're like, this is hard, they're like, this is part of the entrepreneur roller coaster. Yes. I would always remember people like not my upline, but her upline, she would always say, she would pull up the God card and she would always say, this is what Jesus wants for you. And God put you in this position so you can help other people. And, you know, I really encourage you to read these self-help growth, this help self-help growth books. So you can just grow your mindset, listen to podcasts. We love you and we know you can do it. And so I would always feel like, okay, let me keep on going. It's probably myself. I'm probably the bad leader. I'm probably the bad person. And they always make you feel like you're not good enough. They feel like you're not doing something that it's, uh, that it's your, it's, it's because of you why you're not succeeding. And it was just so mentally draining. And every time I knew that if I really needed help, I wasn't going to get help. I was just going to get positivity back, which never really helped me. The toxic positivity back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where you can't be negative. You can't think badly. You can't have any human emotional experience that isn't positive, isn't joy, isn't love. Like anything else is shunned. And that's just that goes uh, completely against the human experience. It's not normal. You should be feeling those things and questioning them. That's critical thinking, which they don't want you to do any, any of. They don't want you to be thinking critically. So how does it feel now that you're on the outside, you know, you're, you're done with it? How does it feel? And even though you're still under contract where you can't legally speak up um, and say your name and whatnot, how does it feel now being on the outside? Oh gosh. Now when I look at the end of the month, when it's the last day of the month, I always laugh at myself and I'm like, dang, three years ago, I was on my computer texting every single person I knew or gosh, a week before the month was over, I would literally calculate my team's number and see what they would need. And I always laugh at myself. Cause I'm like, I, I don't know why I went through that. And my boyfriend and I had lunch yesterday. We're in long distance. And so we had lunch yesterday and he was like, man, you're just so different. And he knew my vision. And so he would always say, it's our vision that we're going to do this to the world or whatever. And he would be like, you're just so different. You're so happy. You're excited again. You love life again. You're not stressed about numbers. You're not looking at your phone when we're at dinner. You're not on a team call where we're having a dinner date. You're not, you know, focusing on your image because you feel like you have to look a certain way. You're not, you know, focusing on all the food you're eating because you have to be 145 pounds, purely muscle mass. You're not, you're not having to just fake a persona that you're not anymore. And it made me cry because I was like, that's true. When I was in Arbonne, I had to stay 145 pounds or else I felt like I wasn't making sales. I had to always post about me lifting weights or else people thought that, you know, they couldn't lose weight. I had to always post about team calls. I had to always post about me being on these extravagant trips. I had to post about me, you know, being with top leaders and it was just so stressful. And now I feel like even though I lost a ton of followers, I don't care. I'm doing what I'm set out to do. I'm loving, you know, going back to school. I finally registered to go back to school, which is so exciting because I know what I want to do. I want to be an interior designer and I want to work with busy professionals to like interior design, decor their whole home. And so for me, I'm excited because I now feel like I have a purpose and I have an actual goal that I'm going to be running towards. Because when I left Arbonne, I had nothing to show for. I had nothing. There was no diploma. There was no anything. I mean, all I had was a Tiffany ring that Arbonne gave me, but that's not to show for. I'm going to have an, a diploma. I'm going to have something to say, like, I did this. And this is what all my hard work it paid off. When I left Arbonne, I had nothing to show for. Nothing but heartache, nothing but mental health, nothing but worry. When I left Arbonne, it was as if there was a big weight lifted off my shoulders. I didn't feel like I had to be somebody that I wasn't. And even though I lost so many friends at this point, I'm super happy at where my life is at. I'm not stressed anymore. I don't feel like I have to post on social media twice a week. I don't feel like I have to be somebody I'm not. And I feel like for the first time I can breathe again. Yes. Yes. Everything you just said. Absolutely. You can freaking breathe. I remember cleaning the house. Like this was like at the very beginning of the year and I had joined an anti-MLM group and I was just, like cleaning my house one day. And I think I had like hoarders playing on, on the TV because that just motivates me to clean. <laughs> and I was cleaning away and I'm like, oh my gosh, what I'm doing right now, I never did when I was in an MLM. I would never just turn on the TV and like take my time cleaning and what, like everything had to be so, so, so fast. And the TV was never 
on ever. Like that was a huge no, no, you know? So to be able to like breathe, I remember posting in the, the group I was the anti MLM group I was in. I was like, it's so nice to be able to just clean my house and relax and not have to worry about jumping on a team call or making a social media post. I don't miss going places and having to take selfies all the time and share what I'm doing 24 seven. You know, if I, if I share something now, it's because I really want to, it's like on my heart or just, you know, on my head and my head and I really want to do it. It doesn't feel so controlled. Um, and you're not constantly worried about the next sale. You're not constantly worried about, you know, what the company is thinking of you or how you can get to the next phase. How's your mental health now that you're out? Oh my gosh. So funny story was towards the end of Arbon, I saw my mental health go so down that I was actually gaining weight. I gained about 30 oh, yeah. pounds. Yeah. I gained about 30 pounds because I was just like, this lifestyle is not attainable. I'm worrying about the foods that I'm eating. I'm worrying about the posts that I'm posting. Like, this is just not attainable. So I lost about 20 pounds. And after getting out, my mental health is just, it feels like it's a 180. It feels like I'm a completely different person because now I reignited my fitness journey. But at this point, it's for myself. At this point, it's not for social media. It's not for my uplines. It's not for sales. It's not to manipulate other people at this time. It's for me. And I feel so weird that I enjoy doing things like going to the gym and lifting and eating healthy and being clean. Like my mental health just looks so different. Um, I'm not reading the old personal growth books that I was before because it just triggers literally like I feel like I'm still in it. So I'm just not reading that to me. I'm more like listening to like anti MLMs or like really good podcasts or I'm following people now that I have the same passion for. So my mental health, whoo girl, it's like at an all time high right now. I'm so happy for you. I love that your boyfriend noticed a change in you because I was talking on the phone recently with my sister before I posted that first video, the one that made you contact me. And I remember saying like, I was so nervous to post about it, but I wanted to share it because it's just so toxic. And she was like, oh yeah, I remember you constantly being stressed out all the time. You were always stressed about your numbers and hitting your quotas. And I'm like, you remember that? Like, I didn't think she noticed that at all. Like, I didn't think that that's something she would have ever thought about with me in my MLM journey. And just the fact that she noticed that about me, I was like, oh my God, like, I wonder how stressed I was appearing to other people that I just, I thought that I thought it was normal. I thought I was like doing good and helping the mission and, you know, hustling for that dream. Yeah. It would be amazing to get to see, you know, the point of view from like a husband or a boyfriend or like, getting to see what they, what they did behind the scenes, because when you're with your family and your husband, your significant other, they see the real behind the scenes because you're not just going to keep it to yourself. Your family sees it and you know, your significant other sees it. The world doesn't see it. So I feel really bad for him because he, he literally helped me through so many anxiety attacks. He helped me through so many months where I was like, I can't do this anymore. And he was like, you just have to keep going. This is all you're good at. And I remember now he's like, you know what? No. It's okay to have a nine to five if you love it. It's okay to have a degree if you love it. Like it is okay. And it's these MLMs, like just, they want you to think like nine to fives are so bad. Going to school is so bad. You shouldn't go to college. You shouldn't do this. MLMs is the way to go. And that's the mindset that I had. And I remember, which is so disgusting. I would tell my team the exact same thing. I would tell them, I didn't go to college. Look where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and they'll just, never tell you that when you join. They'll never say education is bad. If you have any type of degree, that's actually used to help further you. They're like, oh, great, you have contacts, or oh, you can use that to your advantage of why you, you choose this product. Um, but once you get deep in, and like a lot of the self helps will say that self help books will say that too. Like it doesn't matter if you go to college. Like you can be successful without it. And they constantly just beat down education always over and over and over. And like you said, once you're out, you're left with nothing. You are, they make sure that you know, you're disposable to them and you have nothing. And it's really not somebody asks, well, can you put it on a resume? And I'm like, no, like they don't want to see that on a resume. It hinders you. And even though degrees are not the end all be all, like even though some people regret getting a degree or whatever they majored in, you will have it forever. Just like I will always have my license in cosmetology forever. It's something that is always there with you. But when you leave an MLM, you are left with nothing except maybe debt. (laughs) Yeah. 
And in closing, when you left with your, how was your team? Like, did people reach out to you and like, were they mad at you or were they like, I have, I feel the same way. Like, how did that go? So it was more 30, 70. So 70% of my team, when I was on that call, you know, explaining why I was leaving, I remember seeing their faces on a team call and then they would take off their, their, their face on Zoom. And I would be like, oh, okay, that's one person that goes in with what I'm doing. And so slowly they were just taking off their camera. So most of the people, they went ahead and they were under my upline's wing. And she was like, don't worry, I'm going to help you build the business. Don't worry, I'm going to do this, which I'm thinking she's really not going to. So 70% of my team, they completely um, blocked me. They wanted nothing to do with me. They, you know, were like, how dare you leave something where you created such a big name for yourself? They just didn't understand because they weren't high up. And they didn't understand that when you reach a certain amount of leadership, you are in charge of so much more. Um, 30% of my team, those were people that I created solid friendships with, or so I thought. I kept in contact with them for about two to three months. And we talked about how we felt in Arbonne and we talked how we felt so stressed at the time, but we couldn't talk about it. But I guess, you know, friendships fade. And I guess the only common ground that we had was Arbonne. So now it's really sad to get to say that I have talked to nobody from my team. When I left my organization of like hundreds of people and clients and girls, it's really sad that I don't even have friendships to show for it anymore. Right. And it's, it, it is rare. I feel if you do have friendships to show after it. Um, but yeah, when you leave, all of a sudden you threaten those people's dreams of being where you are. And so they don't want to see it. They don't want to talk to you. And yes, a lot of people don't know that when you leave, the rest of your organization goes to your upline. And I have seen so many uplines just turn those teams away from their, their previous upline, like how you left and just make them villainized. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. They, they are, they're seeing this an opportunity as to rebuild themselves as to go ahead and um, act as if they're new sponsoring that they're doing to rebuild their businesses. And I feel like that's what my upline felt like. She felt like, okay, this is a time where I can work with them now, where I can really shoot up my business because I was a really big part of her organization's members. And I feel like she was trying to do whatever she could to nest everybody that was thinking about leaving because she didn't want to lose her numbers that she had. Right. Yeah. She didn't want to lose that money. What would you say to the person who is maybe they, they, they're not making as much as you did. Okay. Maybe they're feeling that way though, that you felt with the stress and the constantly having to be on and never being able to relax and take a moment to breathe. Um, what would you say to them? I would just say, you know, why did you start this business? Like, what is your, what is your end goal? And do you really have a mapped out plan on how you're going to get there? If you feel like you're constantly stressed, if you feel like you have to be somebody that you're not, if you feel like you have to meet quota or meet a big goal for your upline to notice you, if you feel like you're just having to beg people to look into your business, if you feel like you're just not good enough, why are you continuing? And just know that the more you go up the chain, the harder it's going to get. And if you're feeling this way right now of stress and if you feel like you're not good enough, girlfriend, walk away. It is okay. And MLM is not the, it's not, it's not going to be the end of the world. And coming from somebody who was at the top and thought it was going to be the end of the world, it's been a, such an amazing journey to just refigure out myself and, and reopen a new chapter in my book and just know that an MLM is not going to make or break you. Like go for it and figure out your dreams and go back to school if that's what you want to do. You know, don't be stressed. Do not let your mental health get, get horrible just because you want to reach a certain level of success and do your research, ask questions. If you, if you feel like there's a red flag, chances are if there is a red flag, listen to those red flags and do not wait three years down the road when you're probably in debt to walk away. Like listen and do your research now. And this is coming out of a place of love. This is coming out of a place that I was there at that point. And I'm saying this at a place of love that you deserve more and you deserve to, you know, love your life again. That's what I would Absolutely. Normally I would ask you where people can find you, but being as we have to keep you as Jane Doe, we'll wait on that. So if you want to say anything to our Jane Doe, leave it below in the comments where she can read it um, because we can't shout out her Instagram or Facebook or anything yet. Yet. How many, <laughs> how much more time do you have on that contract? 
gosh, until November. So how long is that? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't months. know. Pandemic and everything that's happening. I've given up on trying yeah. to update. <laughs> don't worry, y'all. I'll be back and I'll give y'all <laughs> updates. And I'm so excited to finally get to like show my face and show the world. And yeah. I can't wait. We'll do like a where you are now and you're able to speak out. Well, thank yeah. you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I loved being able to share my story, what I could share. Um, and I'm really looking forward to speaking to you again so we can like recap on what my year looks like. Absolutely. We will talk soon. Bye, hun. All right, girlfriend. Oh my God, not hun, but like bye, love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bye. Thank you for watching. I hope that you found this interview insightful and helpful if you're going through your own journey and struggle in an MLM, or if you have gotten out and are now on the other side. Please know that you are not alone and you can be a survivor just like us. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, stay well. I will talk to you soon.